guys. So just in starting off from last week, um, are you waiting for something? Make sure it goes. Okay. Um, just starting off from last week as uh, money for the benefit of those who were here. Um, the garments that uh, we are expected in the New Testament or a new covenant to be priests unto Yahweh. And to be effective priests, we have to make sure that we've got the right clothes on and we're living our lives accordingly. So um, this will be part two to that. And I'd like to say this week's been a, a massive test for myself. You know, when you preach something or teach something, the first person is, is going to be touched by it's going to be you. So I've been... Um, really uh, tested this week in many, many ways, um, particularly probably from what I'm teaching on this and, and also preparing the series on Rosh Kadesh. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which will not return to your void. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you, Father, that you've called us to be a royal priesthood and we want to be effective priests, Father. We want to see uh, you work, Father, quicker and to, to be not only effective in our prayers, Father, but to see the outworking of those prayers uh, m m being more effective, come to work out more better than what they're working out, Father, to see some changes right across the board, Father, from our families to, to the nations, Father, and what you want us to do as your priests. So we thank you for your word. Thank you for your anointing, Father, particularly on the, uh, the ears of the people that will hear this, Father. And also, Lord, that you'll give us understanding, that, Lord, that you'll be able to open up our spirits for the download of revelation that comes because all, all of us can get our own private revelation. So we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. So I call this design the garment part two. Now, like I said last week, with all these fashion houses with Gucci and uh, Prada and Chanel and Pierre Cardin and all this type of um, name brands and designer clothes that you could buy around the world and, and pay a fortune for them and we all look honky-dory in these type of things that we think we do, <clears throat> excuse me, but actually in the eyes of Yahweh we can be absolutely standing naked because he has clothing that is totally different to this type of thing. He has a brand of his own and it's far better than any of these fashion houses on the, on the planet. So these are designer spirit garments. They're original, they're not available to the public, cannot be purchased online, and cannot be purchased full stop anywhere on the planet. And not available in any store anywhere on the planet because they're given by Yahweh in their spiritual clothing. So in Exodus 28, 1 to 3, because this is what we're looking through last week, so this is our main scripture, Hebrews Roots Bible. Uh, you shall take to yourself your son Aaron, your brother Aaron, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel, from him to serve as priests to me, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, the sons of Aaron. And you shall make holy garments for your brother Aaron, for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak to all the wise hearted whom are filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they shall make the garments of Aaron to sanctify him for his serving as priest to me. So this is talking about the garments that Yahweh wanted made for Aaron and his sons, but Aaron was the high priest, his sons were priests, and these garments were made for glory and beauty, which would represent to us today the anointing of the Spirit of God. So if you want the Spirit of God and the anointing on our lives, then we have to be walking in the things that he wants us to walk in, and we need our spirits clothed with the clothing that he wants us clothed in. So that's what we'll be looking into today. And these um, clothing will also make sure that they were clean before Yahweh when they come to minister to him. And as um, history says that um, 300 priests never made it out of the temple because they put the clothes on but their character didn't line up with their clothing. So they would sanctify them to come and serve before Yahweh. And we also are supposed to be serving Yahweh uh, not just when we come to, into the house of Yahweh, but also um, on a weekly basis that we are like a letter being read by everybody and we are supposed to be manifesting glory and beauty. And I can tell you honestly and openly I was not manifesting too much glory and beauty during the week. 
but it just shows me that when you preach a sermon or teach a sermon that uh, Yahweh, if you're open to it, he's going to deal with you first. So I'm grateful for that. I learned a lot of lessons this week and I'm still learning. So I call these Yahweh's designer garments. When you look at the garments of the high priest, and we're going to conclude this teaching with the things that he expects us to be doing in our lives. These garments are only available to those who live their lives worthy of them. Um, you, you, like I said, you can't buy them. These are something where our lives, our character, our behaviour um, will endeavour to get our spirits clothed in these clothing that he wants us to wear as his uh, spiritual priest. And these garments are for the spirit of a person, they're not for your body, they're not for your soul, they're actually for your spirit. So, And they represent the glory of Elohim, which to us would mean... Uh, the, as I said before, about the anointing and the presence of Yahweh. So if you want the presence of Yahweh, and um, personally I don't want to live one day without his presence, I don't like it when I can't feel his presence. Um, we, want, we need this every day of our lives to walk with the presence of God, the anointing of God on, on our lives in everything we do. So Yahweh is a designer, Moses is a senior tailor, and he has a closed production team, and all the materials have to be specific. And I think I said in one of the videos I've just uh, um, finished for YouTube, that sometimes we read over things in the Word, you know, they're hooks, they're, they're this, they're that, they're little bits and pieces of this, and we think it's very insignificant. But everything that Yahweh puts in his word is very significant to us and we need to pay attention to some of them, because, if not all of them, because in them is a lot of hidden spiritual um, truths inside of them. So you see here that uh, the, the clothing of the high priest, he had his mitre with his gold crown, and you see the breastplate, you see the tunic, you see underneath, you can't see his breeches. And he had a sash and all that type of thing. So they're what we're going to look at today and where that kind of fits into our lives and how we can walk as priests um, before a holy, a holy uh, Elohim. So we left you last week with the question, how do we know that we have priestly garments on to come before him in the correct state? Or how do we even know that we're even wearing the garments properly? Or, you know, we could be naked for all we know. So that were the two questions we got left with last week and, and we prayed about it and I think, you know, I don't know about you, but I think uh, the Lord showed me a few things during the week that need to be adjusted and we'll make the adjustments. So, House of Yahweh. So we'll, instead of being the House of Prada and the House of Gucci, let's call this the House of Yahweh. So first of all, the priest uh, had to have breeches on, uh, which is mitnis. McNeese or McNeese in Hebrew and that word is derived from a root word kanak or ganaz which means to cover up and hide. So if you if you were wearing a pair of breeches well, where would you put them? So obviously it's over your private parts. Obviously. So we get the pictures here that um, as they cover their private parts, they, they, they have a spiritual connotation to them. So let's have a look at this. Exodus 28, 42 to 43. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. So from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach, and they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear, they bear not iniquity and die. And it shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. So it's very important that they had these breeches on uh, when they came um, unto the tabernacle and especially when they come unto the, the, the uh, altar to minister unto Yahweh. Now we've got to put this in the context of what we do when we come to the house of Yahweh and how we live our lives. So the battle against sexual morality and lust. Because if you've got knickers on, or breaches on, covering your private parts, then th th what Yahweh was saying to them, you, they need to be watching the morality and lust and things like that so they come into him uh, pure because you can put breaches on and 300 of them put the breaches on and then come inside the, the temple of Yahweh and drop dead. And that's because they had the breeches on, but their character, whatever they were doing as far as these type of things were concerned, Yahweh is not happy, so hence they died in their effort what they were doing. 
So I bring it in the context of today and what we live in today. I found some stuff on, on, online. So porn sites compromise 12% of the internet and children from, six, from 8 to 16 have viewed pornography. And the adultery today, 90%, the raging epidemic we have of pornography today. And when I'm saying this today, I'm talking in, in the house of Yahweh, but I'm also talking, this is going on right across the board in the house of Yahweh, the people that are caught up uh, in this um, uh, sexual immorality when in, in actual fact we're called to be priests and we wonder why things are not going right in our lives and the lives of our families. So it's very serious to Yahweh and I understand there are people in the body of Christ that don't want to confront these issues. Well, I haven't got a problem confronting them. So I found this little cartoon. This is for you young girls sitting in this uh, congregation and anybody else. Later at school, let's skip school again today and get high. I got some pot from Doug. Cool, guess what? After seeing that film today in health class about safe sex, I decided to lose my virginity on prom night. Hello? And then we go to the tunic. Now this is um, a white tunic that went on underneath the priest's garment. You can read all that yourself when you get that. Uh, the tunic is called the Katanai kat, in Hebrew, in Exodus 28:39. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of, of the needlework, so that's the hat, the sash, and the, the coat there. So they were told to make this white tunic, and what that tunic represents. I really, like I said last week, watching this. Um, I think his name's Ezekiel. I have to go and write it down, write down the website and his ministry, but he's got some really good stuff in it. So um, this is coming from, what, um, I, think I think it's Ezekiel anyway. So this, this was put on them to make atonement for murder, physically and spiritual murder. And so as I started to, to work on this the day before yesterday, and I'm thinking, okay, mm, atonement for murder. Okay, so you, straight away you think, okay, somebody killed somebody. But then the other way started to download some stuff in my head and remind me of a few things that I've lived through. A tongue has no bones, but it can hit harder than a fist. Okay, so it's not only physical murder, it's, it's spiritual murder and what's coming out of our mouths. Okay, and all of us. And so if we are going to be the way Yahweh wants us to be in the priesthood, because that's what he's calling us to, then we all have to look at these six. You know, husbands, you know, Alex and I had a little tizzle during the week. Okay, and it happens. And husbands say things they shouldn't say. Wives say things they shouldn't say. We all say things we shouldn't say. Amen. So this one here is another one Yahweh was showing me during the week, which I hadn't kind of put it together until I started. Li I've listened to him about six times on this and, and tried to put it together the way Yahweh wants me to put it together. Character assassination. So it's not just physical murder. It's also, like I said, spiritual murder. So people who assassinate other people's character, they can't kill the truth, so they're trying to assassinate the character. So what, what is character assassination? The act of saying false things about a person, usually in order to make the public stop liking or trusting that person. Now, I don't know about you. I have to look into my own life and, just, and I have to go back to Yahweh and I have that time to sit down with him. I need to sit down and say, well, I wonder how many people I've assassinated. You understand? So we have to be awfully careful here. So if we are going to stand before him un with an anointing and be able to pray effectively to see things change, then we have to watch what we're saying. So character assassination refers to the slandering or vicious ver personal verbal attack on a person with the intention of destroying or damaging that person's reputation or confidence 
In other words, it is a malicious verbal assault designed to damage or tarnish the reputation of a person. How many times have we done that? And it's going on in the body of Christ. And we wonder why the church is so weak and so ineffective. (coughs) And this guy here, Marvin J. Ashton, how damaging is a habit that permits fault finding? You know, look, we can if, if we line up each other, it's it, you know we don't have to be a rocket science to find all the faults in one another. I don't think you get a, a what do you call? It? I don't think you get a crown for fault finding. Character assassination and the sharing of malicious rumours, gossip, and caustic comments often create chains of contention. So this white tunic, first of all, we're dealing with our immorality or moral compass, and then, okay, he switches from the private parts up to the mouth. The turban emits nefet, beautiful turban there. I got this off the, what do you call it, the um, Temple Institute. Exodus 28, 29, same scriptures before. And thou shalt embroider the coat of linen, thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. So everything had to be made exactly as Yahweh said had to be made, with what materials, etc., etc. This deals with pride. Now, like I said on one of my tapes, um, some people say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. Well, yes, there is, because if you say that, you're full of pride. So some psalms, some psalms here at Proverbs which makes us look into these things and see uh, if we think there may be pride in us or we have to ask Yahweh and pr- pride is like bad breath. You're the last person you know, to know you've got it. So Psalm 10 verse 4, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for Yahweh. Now, please take note here. There is no room for Yahweh in the thoughts of a prideful person. You think about that one, meditate on that one for a little while. Uh, Proverbs 8.13, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behaviour and perverse speech. So he's wrapped up pride and arrogance together, he's wrapped up evil behaviour and he's put perverse speech in the same bracket. Proverbs 11.2, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Ecclesiastes 7.8, Patience is better than pride. And we all know how hard patience is to get. Isaiah 2.11, The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled, and human pride brought low, and Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. So, uh, across the nations and the tail end one there, Ezekiel 7.24, the most wicked of nations will put an end to the pride of the mighty and their sanctuaries will be des- desecrated. So, you know, it's not only uh, our pride in the church, it's not only um, uh, leaders' pride, we're talking about right across the board, even nations and anyone else that's in authority, okay, any human pride, Yahweh's going to bring it low. So we, as professing quote-unquote New Testament priests, have to continually be in check that we are not in pride. And Isaiah 13 verse 11, I'll put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and humble the pride of the ruthless. So... Have a good look. I'm not against selfies in a group. But when you're snapping yourself all the time, I think you have to ask yourself a question. Why are you snapping yourself? Hmm? Think about it. So God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble out of James 4, 6. Now the sash is avnit, avnit, in Hebrew, um, and I love this guy, he was really good. Anyway, again, Exodus 28, verse 34. I love him as a Christian brother. Okay. And thou shalt embroider the coat of the fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. 
Now this uh, sash that they put around themselves was actually 32 cubits long. So if you multiply 18 inches by 32, uh, you'll get the length, unless it was a royal cubit, and that was a little bit longer. And they would wrap it around, not only their waist, but wrap it around their chest. And so he was saying that the Gematria number is 32, and wrapped around their chest, and the Lambeth and the Bet equaled Lev, which means heart. So it's all about the heart, what we were sharing about last week about the heart. And he was saying there are 32 cranial nerves that run down the back of the neck or the brain to the heart. Okay, so like we said last week, the brain and the heart working together. And the brain regulates the heart. So in someone's mind, when the blood boils over, you know, when you are losing the plot or having a meltdown, that brain starts to communicate with the heart, then pump toxins through the blood. So, kosher or toxic blood, what have we got? And, it's, and you know, talking about the anger last week, and then again yesterday on the, when we did the uh, YouTube for ARF, and what was coming out, it's just... You know, um, the human body, the way Yahweh intended it to function, I think we're a long way away from the way he created it to function. We would be a lot more happier and a lot more healthier if we could do it his way, which we, we cannot do without him helping us anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. So 32 cubits wrapped around the chest, all about the heart. And this is dealing with the impure thoughts. Now it's very interesting, you've got your breaches for sexual immorality, which all starts in the mind anyway, and then you've got your coat for your mouth, basically, and that's all got to still originate in your head. If you're bla blasting away at somebody or running them down or, or telling lies or you don't want people to like them, so you make up some concoction story. But this is also dealing with more impure thoughts. So you can see here from what Alex was talking about the other week and when do you follow on from this about death to self? You know, like how hard it is to re restrain ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we've got to walk away uh, and learn to shut up and walk away, okay? So, Psalm 119, 9 to 11. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed to your word? With my whole heart I've sought you, oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the more we're in the word, the more we're more likely to have a bit of a clean mind. Amen? Now I'm not saying that that's, what do you call it, um, a legalistic point of view, but the, the more you're in the word, the more likely you're going to have a clean mind, but that's not taken away your humanity, that you can be pushed to the limit and pushed over the edge that you just have a meltdown. It happens because we're human, we're not machines. The breastplate, the Hoshan Mishpat, was a breastplate of judgment. Um, this rabbi said they called it the breastplate of justice, but actually in the scripture, it actually in this scripture anyway, in Exodus 28, 15 through 22, it says, Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning words, and it goes down to tell you, to the, I'm going to read it anyway. After the work of the F5, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, of, and of purple, of scarlet, and of fine twine linen, thou shalt make it. Four square it shall be being doubled, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in the settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, topaz, and a carbuncle, and this shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, and an agate, and an amethyst. So it's a breastplate of judgment. And the fourth row, a beryl, a row of a beryl and an onyx and a jasper, and they shall be set in gold in their enclosing, and the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes, and thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of the reason work of pure gold. The square shape worn over the heart, it was called so because of the unique role which it played in helping to render fateful decisions. Wisdom. 
when we have to make major decisions. Amen? So we as priests need wisdom because each one of us faces times in our lives where we have to make decisions, fateful decisions, decisions which can alter the course of our lives. And I've said before and I'll say it again, if people would just sit down for five minutes as they're about to make a decision, something that, that's, you know, going to affect their lives and think just for five minutes, who is this, if I make this decision today, who's it going to affect? What is going to be the rippling effect of this decision I make today? Will it hurt my family? Can it hurt anybody? Not only myself, can this decision make the, do damage to me as well? If people would only take time to sit down when they're deciding things, especially big decisions, and dwell on the circumstances more than the decisions, then they wouldn't have so much trouble as they do, as they do and they have in their lives. So Yahweh wants us to be very wise in decision making. The effort. So Aphodi, Aphodi, I think it is. Aphodi or Aphodi. The ephod and the breastplate were all made of five elements, all the same colours. Nexus 28, 6, through 15, 6 and 15. And they shall make the ephod of gold, sky blue, dark red, and crimson dyed wool and twisted linen. And they shall make the breastplate of judgment, the work of an artist, after the manner of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, sky blue, dark red, and crimson dyed wool, and of twisted linen, you shall make the same materials. Now the ephod and the breastplate, these materials, the gold, the deity and the divinity, the sky blue, the Torah and heaven, the dark red, atonement, redemption, crimson, humanity and sin, and twisted linen, holiness and righteousness. So this is a classic picture of Yahweh and Yeshua and the work he, he done on the cross. It's all there. Um, and I found out the twisted linen in Hebrew is Shesh Moshah. I didn't look at the other ones. I just happened to find that one. Now the blue row, the Ma'il, this is called, and you can read that writing there for yourself. This was a, a sleeveless garment, a bit like what Yeshua had on when he was crucified. Uh, Exodus 28, 31 through 35, And thou shalt make a robe of the ephod of all blue, and there shall be a hole in the top of it, in the midst of, thereof, and it shall have a binding of woven work around the, about the whole of it, as it were the whole of a hard, hard, harbour geon, that it not be rent. So harbour geon means sleeveless. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scale around the, about the hem thereof, and the bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe round about, and it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before Yahweh, and when he cometh out, that he not die. Now this was a sleeveless, full-length outer garment split on the sides with 72 bells and 72 pomegranates sewn to the bottom hem of the garment. Now it's interesting, and I'll just say this here, I've got to be careful what I say. I'll just kind of throw a hook out there. It's interesting that the number 72's here for uh, pomegranates and bells and other people say when you get to heaven you get 72 virgins. So, you know, think what you like. Okay, it was entirely sky blue in colour and the pomegranates were made of blue, purple and scarlet wool. The golden bells were audible while the fruit was silent. Now, I have taught and I still will teach but I've also gone to another way here because you know, the fruit, one was the fruit of the Spirit and one was the gifts of the Spirit, and that can be, that can be okay as well. But uh, listening to the Jewish aspect of it, you get another slant. 
So this speaks to the truth that what we say, our words, and what we do, our actions, should be the same. Our speech must be pure and heavenly in nature, and no evil words or lash on hurrah emitting from our mouths. Being righteous in character and spirit, manifesting the fruit of the spirit, not then the works of the flesh. So again, we're touching the mouth again. There's a common pattern here I'm noticing. Even doing this, I'm noticing something else. The golden crown, zitz in Hebrew, means blossom, flower or plate. It was to deal with brazenness in the life of the priest, uh, which brazenness, when I looked up what it meant, unashamed sense of shame. Some people have got no shame at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Beautiful crown. Holiness unto, holiness unto Yahweh. In Exodus 28, 36 to 38, thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to Yahweh. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace that it may upon the, be upon the mitre, and upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always, it shall be always upon his forehead that they may be accepted before Yahweh. Holiness unto Yahweh. So this uh, rabbi was saying that the crown was put there to subdue the animalistic drive of man, always watching for arrogant thinking, condescending behaviour, and animalistic behaviour. And that can only really happen under the control of the Holy Spirit because you only have to pick up the newspaper, you only have to listen to the news, and you see how the animalistic drive of a man or a woman manifests in their lives. We saw the other day that uh, one man that was in prison, the other prisoners decided to pour boiling water over him. Is that right? No. What is that? It's the animalistic drive in man that's cruel. And we see that in animals and what they're doing. We see that drive in man that's it's absolutely evil as far as Yahweh is concerned. And just because we are a Christian, quote unquote, and just because we say we're following Christ does not mean to say that we have full control or we've given the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKadosh, full control over that part of our nature that is animalistic because all of us at times can be quite cruel. I'm not saying we go around killing animals, which we shouldn't be, but people do. Uh, I'm surprised what they do. And, um, and also, you know, condescending behaviour. We see this with different things. We were watching last night, Alex and I, the tail end of uh, Winston Churchill and uh, Adolf Hitler. And Winston Churchill was always out amongst the people. He was on the boats. He was talking to the people. He was out amongst the the uh, the, the, the gun smoke, and he, he was there talking to the soldiers. But uh, Adolf Hitler, he never come near him. He, he stayed around his his group of people, and at the end of his life, he, no one hardly ever saw him. Uh, you know, totally two different different men. Okay, and so that's how it goes with that story. So cruelty. So. Human beings, if we watch ISIS and we watch all these stories that are going on today and some of it, you just shake your head that how can another human being do that? I just watched uh, something come in on my prophetic email I was telling Alex about yesterday. A man, I don't know where it was, I forgot, uh, his wife had said to him, well, I just need a break. Um, most women from now and then want a break from their husbands. I can totally understand her saying that to him. Now, break doesn't mean to say you're going to leave them or divorce them. You just need a break. Okay, so he rang her up and said, well, I'm about to uh, smash your heart into 50,000 pieces and say goodbye to your children. And he proceeded to slaughter his three-year-old son and his little girl. Um, and they just jailed him for 31 years. Um, you know, just needless cruelty 
um, should never have happened. So you, you see all these things in a human being. So God uses his uh, crown on his priest to bring these things into subjection in all of us. And so we too, if we're going to be crowned with holiness unto Yahweh, well then we've got to learn not to be cruel. And also it deals with lust. And I like what this um, rabbi was saying. Um, I'm giving him a good plug here, so I've got to get his proper name and, and his ministry so you can all have a look at some of this stuff. And he said, that's not him, this is just the rabbi, so I can portray the story. The rabbi was saying that as an example, the way animalistic people think, and he, he um, and we're talking to adults here, so Sophie's not here, so I can say this, and um, not really for children's ears if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever. But he said, you know, most husbands um, know what a rooster is. And he said, and that's the way some husbands treat their wives, like a rooster in a hen pen. Uh, wham, bam, and thank you, ma'am. I thought I was the only one that said that, but he said it. You know, just thank you very much. They're like a rooster, hop on and hop off, and that's the end of the story. That's how they treat their wives. So he said, you catch me drift, what he was talking about. So he was just saying, in marriage, and using marriage as an example, the immoral thoughts start in the mind of a man. And that immorality and the moral compass starts to go like this. Okay, the impure thoughts come in. Okay, and then fantasy comes in. Uh, the fallacy comes in. I mean, how many men, I mean, honestly, for you out there too, how many men have ever dreamt of having sex with Marilyn Monroe? Hands up. That's a fantasy. That's an absolute fallacy because she wouldn't give you the time of day. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> she wouldn't give you a second glance. And, and then that comes into promiscuity. Okay, but how many are out there? Fantas are they married? They're married. And then he said there's this, this, this uh, he called it an adrenaline rush. I call it the hormone surge. Okay, and then sexual immorality starts pumping through the blood. Just like the, he said about the anger and the toxic murder running through the blood. I'm going to kill you. You know, it starts to pump through the blood. Then he said, the man takes the glory from his wife and gives it to the other woman that he's, fa he's fantasising about and having this fallacy about. He's given the glory from his wife, he's given it to that man. Now think about this in, in today's context. In the body of Christ today, according to Rick Joyner, 90% of the pastors in America are in pornography. How many of those pastors are married who have given the glory of their wives to other women? And the sages say this, now this is a bit of a shocker. The man who has sex with his wife, creating a child in that time, while thinking of another woman, created an idol. The other woman become the idol. And we'll come out in the sea, that should be seed, sorry, I'll, we'll get this fixed up tonight. We'll come out in the seed that he has deposited in the womb of his wife, creating a rebellious child. Because he was worshipping something that did not belong to him. How about that one? Hmm, makes you think. Rebellious child? Yeah, really. Dun 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 dun. dun. Huh? Now you think about that one. How many children have been conceived that way? Because we don't know when, you know, you girls, you know, I realise, you know, you know. But we don't know what's happened to us when somebody's, you know, our own husbands were having sex or what they're thinking about. <laughs> Serious stuff. And only Yahweh knows this stuff. So this is scary. I thought, oh, holy moly. And Alex was in the bathroom listening to him. He, oh, wow. So we are called to be priests. Okay. 
Exodus 19 verse 6 and you shall become a kingdom of priests to be a holy nation these are the words which you shall speak to the sons of Israel paralleling 1 Peter 2 verse 9 but you are an elect race a royal priesthood a holy people and a people for possession that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness to his precious light so Peter's just quoting back to Exodus the same thing that Moses is saying in Exodus about Israel and if we are grafted into Israel, we are part of the commonwealth of Israel, we inherit the blessing and the covenant promises of Israel, then we are called to be spiritual priests unto Yahweh just as much as they are. I'm not talking about a Roman Catholic priesthood, I'm not talking about any other priesthood, natural priesthood, I'm talking about a spiritual priesthood. And there's a lot of teachings out there, I haven't looked into it yet, there, apparently there's a, a Melchizedek, priesthood, there's a Zadok priesthood they're saying that when the Ezekiel's temple is built it's going to be a Zadok priesthood, Yeshua's of the Mechizeldek priesthood so that's a natural thing and a spiritual thing but we are called to be spiritual priests unto Yahweh and we are supposed to come before him as clean as possible and if we should fall in these traps and we will fall in these traps then we have to get out of these traps through repentance, look at our lives and think okay I need to change and if you can't change in your own human strength then we have somebody that will give us the grace and the power to change and help us cleanse the way we live our lives and the way we see because we can't hide what we think and we can't even have sex with our wives and we can't have sex with our husbands without Yahweh knowing what we're thinking so it's a, it's a delusion and a joke to think that we can get away with some of the things that we do and think that nobody knows about it, just me, because it's just me thinking this when there's a holy God out there knowing exactly what you're thinking and exactly what you're doing. You can't even go to the bathroom without him watching what he's watching everything you do, he's watching everything you think, he's watching everything you say. And we have to become very Yahweh conscious about this that we have two eyes that are watching us every move that we make, every breath that we take, every thought that we think, everything that we do is being watched and being recorded. That's even more scarier. So how much more should that encourage us to start thinking a little bit more along pure lines and deal with things that we know is not right. We know that Yeshua wouldn't think those things and we know Yeshua wouldn't do those things and so we need to be mature and grow up a little bit in the way we're walking our lives and working out our lives and trying to be what he's called us to be by his grace and his grace alone. So, what is clothing our spirits? The results of living a life for self, and I also touched this on the... Um, month of half so you can put them all together idolatry and witchcraft wrong religion now they put here religion but there's other things to that you can put tattoos in there you can put prayer in there that's part of religion too you can put drugs in there okay or religion is the drug anyway then self-ruling the life and then your wrong behavior you have murders you have drunkenness you have reveling so a lot of these clothing deals with wrong uh, behaviour, then the wrong morals, uh, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness and uncleanness, and then we have wrong attitudes of hating, quarrelling, rivalry, strife, violent temper, seditions, heresies and envies. So what's clothing our spirits? Wrong morals, wrong attitudes, wrong behaviour and wrong religion, is that the clothes we're wearing? Or is it the garments of glory and beauty which has to be the fruit of the spirit which is love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, self-control and that's what we're touching about uh, um, anger it's just a lack of self-control, it's a lack of that fruit there, that one there and, and you, get, it, you cannot go to Kmart and buy self-control it's like we said last year, week, you can't go to Kmart and buy a box of anger you can't go to Kmart and buy a box of self-control either. It's outworked in our lives and I believe it's only outworked by being tested. Put in a position where you have to exercise self-control or you blow the fuse too. Long-suffering, goodness and gentleness. So we've got to ask ourselves what we're clothed with. At the present moment, I've got a lot of trouble here. 
I used to have a lot of trouble with, where's that patience thing? Long suffering. I think I might have, not too bad. But I'm not, at the present minute, he's putting his finger on this thing. So Romans 13, 14, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't bother translating this in the other, uh, what do you call it, um, translation. And do, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. You know, we say tit for tat, you hurt me, I hurt you. You say something bad about me, I'm going to say something bad about you. You know, you stab me in the back, I'm going to stab you in the back, okay? We've got to come past all this immaturity. Okay, so clothe ourselves, and he is our great high priest at the present minute. Okay, so we need to clothe ourselves with him, which is the fruit of the spirit, clothes of glory and beauty, okay, and start to deal with some of these issues that hold us back from being what he wants us to be. James 5 verse 16, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, or a righteous woman availeth much. So if you want a, a prevailing prayer and a veil, prevail and avail, okay, we need to come clean before him, okay? Israel, the royal priesthood, and this is what we're called to, royal priesthood. It's a journey, I believe it's a journey. And I'm a chosen priest. <laughs> You're a chosen priest. Okay. And you know what amazes me about all this is he, he, he chooses us in all our human frailty. I just shake my head the how a loving, gentle, kind Elohim or God could ever call someone like me to a priesthood <laughs> that I used to be. And even when I, you know, even when I make mistakes, now I made a few this week. I'm being ruthlessly honest with you. I made a few this week, uh, but I have repented and I am forgiven. But that doesn't mean to say I keep doing it. You know what I'm saying? So all these clothes. Okay, when you look into it, when you get your own presentation, you can sit down and and look over it and and pray it through. Okay. But all of us know when we think something wrong. You know, all of us know when we say something wrong. All of us know when our behaviour is not Christ-like. Okay, we know, and it's having enough uh, what do you call it, humility to say, well, well, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have thought that. That's not very good. Okay, so that we stay spiritually clothed. Amen. And if our clothes drop off, and sometimes they might, I think mine dropped off this week, <laughs> then we just repent and put them back on again and go on. You'll see me say that repeatedly in the YouTubes. We repent and we go on. Okay, we don't sit there and beat ourselves up and grovel and carry on. We repent and we go on. Amen? Okay. So, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of Yahweh stands forever. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Um, I thank you, Father, for the priesthood and so many things to learn from all these little things about the garments and, and uh, from the Jewish, uh, of the Hebraic sense, Father, what they were put on the priest for. I thank you for our dear Jewish brethren that know the Bible inside, backwards and forwards that the way we'll never know it. And I thank you for their, um, what do you call it, exposition of Hebrew words that we don't get. And um, I, I thank you for us, um, for this guy. I think his name is Ezekiel because it's written in Hebrew. Um, so I really thank you, Father, that uh, inside here, even from, from learning about um, human nature, uh, learning about what the heart is and what the heart is not, uh, watching very carefully what we say um, about other people, that we're not running around um, assassinating people's characters, and, and keep our mouths clean the best as possible by your grace and Father give us the grace and, and forgive us for the times we've failed badly here um, and we just thank you Father the grace is available because we can come before your uh, throne boldly and ask for grace in the time of need so we thank you Father we want to be uh, what you've created us to be Father and that's a kingdom of priests spiritual priests unto you and we want to be clothed in garments of glory and beauty, Father, and we want to move and flow under your power and your anointing. So help us do what we need to do, and Father, in this coming week, because this, this part of the word will not go out void either, for all of us, Father, where we have behaved the wrong way, 
our attitudes have been wrong and we've thought the wrong things, Father, whether it's past, present, that needs to be repented of, Father, then you bring it back to our memories, please, Father, that we can repent of it and go on. We thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.